today, anyhow, and over the next few classes is deploying your application. In other words, how do you get your application, uh, how do you get your Java code in the hands of the people that need to run it? All right? And essentially, there are, there are two choices if we're going to wrap them up into broad categories. And each of the choices offer some advantages, disadvantages, and so on. So let's, let's look at them. Essentially, you can have an application installed on a person's machine. Or you can have a web-based application. Let's make sure we understand what that means. All right. Um, application installed would be something like, for instance, an Android application. With an Android application, I actually go and I download software to my phone, <coughs> my Android device, and it goes through an installation procedure, and it puts a copy of that application on my device. All right, so there's a copy of the application on my device. Now, that application might use other resources, for example. It might go to the web for certain things. Uh, for instance, for that might be if I had an eBay application. Um, it's not like it's downloading every single item from the eBay site onto my phone. I sort of have a shell of an application that goes out to the web and, and gets that. But still, there's software that gets installed on my machine. Creating a jar and giving that jar to someone to install would be an example of that, where they have a copy of the application on their device. A web-based is where you are accessing the application through the browser. The application itself is actually run on a server, all right, and communicates using HTML to the server and back. We can look at Amazon as being an application if we talk about their website, right? It's an application. It allows us to enter orders into their system and have orders shipped and do all kinds of things that maybe in the past there was an application written that would run on someone's computer and maybe you would call in and uh, order something via a catalog company or you would uh, uh, mail in an order form and someone would manually enter it into their order system. Well now that application communicates to you through an HTML page and that application itself runs on a web server. So the application to do your search and come up with a list of items that match what you've keyed in in your search. That runs on a web server and gives the results and communicates to the user using HTML pages. Forms, HTML pages, it communicates to the user. In order to run that, <coughs> you don't need to install any software. Do you need to install any software to go and order something from Amazon? No, on the web. You simply need a web browser. A web browser is simply a piece of software that allows um, communication using the various protocols on the web. This is known as, sometimes this is known as a thin client. All right. Whereas having an application installed, I guess, would be having a thick client. In other words, how much stuff is on your device? All right, how much stuff is on your device? Um, in the case of downloading and installing a Android application on your device, you're actually downloading and installing a piece of software. Uh, so if you're going to do that for Amazon, you would have a piece of software for the Amazon site on your device. 
as opposed to using the Amazon web page, in which case you don't really have any special software on your device, just a, um, just a, uh, uh, a browser that accesses web pages. As you might imagine, there are some advantages and disadvantages to both approach. Um, typically speaking, with web-based stuff, um, upgrading becomes very easy. All right, because with upgrading, you only need to have the server upgraded. If Amazon made a change in their search algorithm, let's say to give you better search results, all right, you would not need to download a new version of Amazon if you were accessing their website. In other words, as soon as they make the change on their web server, every client that goes and accesses their website gets that change. Because the software doesn't run on each machine, the software runs on the server. So if Google improves their, their search algorithm, or eBay improves their um, search algorithm, or Netflix uh, improves their um, uh, recommendation algorithm, if you go to their website, the next time you visit their website, you get the effect and the impact of that change. Compared to an application that is downloaded and installed on their computer, uh, which, again, to get the new version of it, to get bug fixes or whatever, you have to download a new version of the software. Now, to be sure, these lines have sort of uh, blurred over the past few years because you can turn on automatic updating. So for example, on my Android device, every day I'll see it updated a couple of apps, all right, without me doing anything. Uh, and in addition, apps sometimes communicate to the web uh, for, and get information from a web server, which means that if the web server is down, you can't use the app. Or if you're not connected to the web, you can't use the app. Um, but in general, the big advantage of doing it this way is having it installed as you actually have it installed on, on your device. You may be able to run application if you're not connected to the web. depending on, again, exactly how the application is written. Another drawback of this is your application could be out of date. Now, I know that you can enable automatic updating and you can make sure your applications stay up to date the next time you use them. But if you did not allow for automatic updating, I could be running a version of any application that's installed on my device that's slightly out of date. Why? Because I have a copy of that software on my device, which means if they make a change, it has to be downloaded and, uh, and updated on my device in order for the change to take effect. This will take up resources. If I install a CNN application, let's say, a CNN app, or an Amazon app, or an eBay app, that takes up a certain amount of space on my device. If, however, instead I use the CNN website, or the uh, Amazon website, or the eBay website, or whatever, I'm really not using up too much resources on my device, all right? Because it's going out and it's doing all the work on the web server, and all I'm doing is I'm accessing web pages via the web browser. So really not much of a resource drain on my device that way. All right? The browser is doing very simple work compared to the work that an application does. Another downside of writing an application, uh, as opposed to using a web-based thing, is that with an application, you would need different versions of it. All right? So you would need a version that worked on Android, you need a version that worked on iOS devices, 
And you might need a version that works on Macs versus PCs if you wanted to, to take it that far. All right, if you wanted to have both mobile and non-mobile platforms. Whereas a website, is there a different website for mobile devices versus desktop? Well, in some cases, yes, but in some cases, no. That they access the same website and you really don't have to, uh, really doesn't matter. That one website can work, if it's designed correctly, can work for people on a variety of different user, uh, user devices. So like I mentioned, a lot of these things have grayed, but in general terms, that's sort of the dilemma that you, th those are the issues that you consider. With a web-based solution, you don't have to worry about updating cl the client, right? Because all the client has is a web browser. It doesn't take up much resources on it. The application is not going to be on date, uh, out of date at all, but, and a big drawback is, is you do have to be connected to the web. And if you're not connected to the web, you really, in most cases, can't do anything. Now, changes in technology, like I said, have sort of blurred these lines, but that's sort of the starting point that we're coming off of. So what I'd like to do today is explore at least a couple of examples of using web technologies to deliver your Java code. All right? Now, this is coming at the end of the class. That doesn't mean that you do all your Java programming, then at the last minute you decide if it's going to be web-based or an installable program or something like that. That would typically be a decision made very early on in the game. All right? But there are different <coughs> ways that you can create there's different places that your Java code could appear. And one of them is on web pages, all right, and web technologies. Now, some of you have done the CISS 243 class, which is the ASP.NET class, where you use C Sharp and the ASP.NET framework to create web pages that are dynamic and all that. Which class is that? Web, web database integration, yeah. So what I like to do is I like to talk about a little bit of how server-side scripting works in general, and then talk about the Java implementation of that. All right? Server-side scripting is where you have a client, which is usually someone running a web browser, connecting to the internet, and accessing a web server. The client makes a request, and the server responds to the request. That's sort of just general terminology used anytime you talk about client-server development. Clients make requests, servers respond to requests. So the request for a web page typically consists of a URL. I'm asking for this particular web page. Now that gets routed to the appropriate web server with IP addresses, domain name lookups, all those other things that you learn in networking and other kinds of classes. We don't care about that. We just care that when it makes it to the uh, right web server, <coughs> The web server responds back with a page that contains HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a standard web page. It's going to have some mix of those three things. Now, in the case of plain, static, unchanging web pages, these HTML files and CSS and JavaScript files are out there already pre-written and they don't change unless someone actually manually goes in and changes the code. So if you access, if you request a static HTML page, you'll get back some HTML that someone wrote that contains CSS and JavaScript and that will get delivered back to you. And if it's a static page, it will look the same as the day that it was written. All right. The HTML doesn't change unless you've manually changed it. Now, what's a little different than that are what are called dynamic web pages. 
And dynamic pages really are what makes the web work the way that it does. With static pages, I could put out just a simple piece of information about something. But it doesn't change. It won't look any different for if a different person accesses it. It won't look any different if the person's from a different place or if it's a different day that they access it or whatever. It's static. It's unchanging. Now, if you consider something like Google, that's a dynamic web page. Because with Google, <coughs> when I search for something, I'll get different things depending on what I search for. I'm always calling the same page, www.google.com slash search. But it's smart enough to take the data that I've entered into the form and customize my results to just show that. So Java um, array list. All right. I have a web page about Java array lists. All right? And if I do C sharp array list, I get something about C sharp array lists. So it takes my input and it customizes the results. This isn't done with plain old HTML. All right? This is done using some sort of server side scripting language. This language could be any one of a number of languages, and we'll talk about the possibilities in a second. But these languages typically take the form data, they typically interact with some database, and they create a custom page for the user. In the form data is information about like what people are searching for, so the data that <coughs> Uh, comes in. Also part of the request is the IP address of the client, which translates to an approximate location. Also the platform that someone's using. Are they using Android, iOS, Windows, Macintosh, and so on. So when a client makes a request, a lot of information comes over, the data that was entered into the form, information about the location, information about the flat platform. That all comes to the server. And with server-side scripting, the server can actually customize the results based on that information that comes as part of the request. So if I do a search here for Italian restaurants, notice it shows me restaurants that are in the Lorain County area. Best Italian restaurants in Lorain, near Illyria, in Lorain County, at the Midway Mall, Sorrento's, and so on down the line. Pardon me? I'm making fun of Olive Garden? Yeah, I, I understand that it's not like gourmet cuisine, but I'll still eat there. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not picky. Yeah. And I do like the breadsticks and the salad and, and all that. So yeah, you're right. All right. I'll bet, for example, if we did the search in Rome, that we probably wouldn't get the Olive Garden on the list. It probably would be some better Italian restaurants, even better than the Olive Garden in Rome. All right. Yeah. Now, In the case of server-side scripting, all that information that I send to the server gets processed by code, by programs. All right? And 
it could be using ASP.NET and C Sharp. It could be doing PHP, could be doing Python, could be doing Ruby on Rails. Or it be, could be using Java-based technology, which we're interested in this class, which are JSP pages and Java servlets. Okay? But it's regular programming, like we've done all the semester, if statements, loops, functions, that sort of thing. And those programs, their output is, guess what? an HTML page. So they do their thing and just like we have in our examples, we've done system out print LN or something like that, their output gets sent to a web browser. So they output HTML that gets sent to a web browser and then the person that made the request can see the result of it. So, you know, I don't know what language Google is written, what Google is written in, but I do know that they run some server-side scripting that takes all that data, does everything it needs to do, and returns the results. They very well could have. They very well could have developed something proprietary. Okay, could very well be. All right. But... All of these things do the same thing. They're, they're the same thing in principle, right? Uh, they're just different, different, the language, the specifics of the language are different for each of these. Other examples of server-side scripting would be Canvas, right? We both log in, we both go to the same page, but your page looks different than mine. Why? Because one of the things it did is it took the credentials, the username and password, verified that we were an appropriate user, and then creates a custom home page based on the information in the database about what classes you're taking, what your role is in those classes, and so on. Now, we're going to start zeroing in on the Java-based technologies that do this. And again, the, the task isn't to make you experts in these technologies, but to introduce you to them and to give you an idea sort of of how these work. All right? Web servers, there's typically two kinds of web servers essentially in the world. There is Apache and there are Microsoft web servers. Microsoft web server is IIS. Apache is a non-Microsoft technology. Apache is an open source application, which is amazing that the biggest web, soft, uh, web server software in the world is an open source application. Apache is cross-platform, while Microsoft servers typically just run on Windows machines. What a web server software is, is software that listens for requests and prepares responses. So, if we were talking about a Microsoft IIS server that is running ASP.NET, it would be listening for requests for web pages and it would be able to run ASP.NET slash C -sharp code connect to a database, and prepare and output the HTML response. Remember, when the day is done, whether it be a dynamic page done via server-side scripting or a static web page, it's going to deliver HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's just the process of how that page gets created that's different. Now, what about Java pages? the two kinds of pages I mentioned, Java servlets and JSP pages. Now, there's an add-on to web servers that allow you to run JSP pages and Java servlets, and that add-in is called Tomcat. Okay, so if you had a server, you'd want to add the Tomcat add-on 
to allow you to do JSP pages. All right? So you need that additional piece on the server side to handle JSP pages. Now, I've been throwing these terms around a lot, JSP and Java Servlet. And in a way, they're kind of like the old commercial for Reese's peanut butter cups. If you remember, someone's holding a piece of chocolate and someone's holding uh, a jar of peanut butter and they run into each other and the one guy says, you got chocolate in my peanut butter and the other one says, no, you got peanut butter or you got chocolate in my peanut butter. The other one says, you got peanut butter on my chocolate, right? Because both JSP and Java servlets have both Java and HTML in them. The difference is, is JSP pages are basically basically an HTML page that contains Java code. Whereas Java servlets are Java classes that output HTML code. So both of them are a mix of Java and HTML. JSP pages embed some Java code in the middle of essentially a plain old HTML document. Whereas Java servlets are a Java class that output HTML. Let's look first at an example of a Java servlet. So here's about the simplest example that we can think of, a Hello World web page. And Java servlets are classes that extend the class HTTP servlet. And there's a couple of proper, or a couple of, of methods that exist that you overwrite, that you overwrite when you uh, um, create a Java servlet. One of them is the init, which does some initialization, and destroy, which does some wrap-up activities. And then do get, which actually um, is used to uh, process the request. So in this case, we're defining that, hey, we're outputting HTML, which typically is what we're going to do. It's possible that we could output XML in some cases. But in this case, we're outputting XML or HTML, and that's what that says. Here we have our logic that creates the HTML. And we create an output pipe that's going to send the response to the user. All right, so print writer is a class, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, print writer is a class, and we're using that to create an out object. And the purpose of that is this is going to send whatever we write, whatever we print using this out object, is going to send to the client. So in this case, we're outputting an H1 tag followed by our message, which is hello world, followed by the closing H1 tag. So when this servlet, this servlet first of all gets compiled, just like any of our Java classes do. And then when it gets run, it, and again, there's, there's ways to describe the Java servlet uh, in, within Tomcat, you specify the servlet and what classes it uses and so on. And then when you request this servlet, and that goes and maps the name of the servlet to the servlet class. And then when you run it, what you get back is just the HTML that it outputted or generated. All right. The key thing to remember, because we're not going to be writing these Java servlets, but the Java servlet is a Java class that extends HTTP servlet and outputs HTML. Let's see if we can find a little bit better example. All right, here's essentially the hello world one again. All right, and what we're doing is, notice again, it has some initialization, has a do get that goes and does its thing, specifies the output, and then outputs some HTML. And then the destroy is sort of wrap-up activities. We then have to configure and say how these pages map to the servlet. So if we request my HTTP servlet, it uses the class example HTTP servlet. It's not what you write, it is the ancestor for the servlet okay. class. Let's, all these are such simple examples, so let's see if we can find a little bit better one of a servlet. All right, here we go. This is a servlet to do some calculation, okay? And do post, which is different than do get. Remember, you can either post or get data on a, uh, uh, in a web application. So this is expecting you use the post method. And it grabs some parameters from the form, or you could grab it from the query string. If it, if it was in the do get. We do some calculations. All right. And I think what we do is we end up redirecting people to different pages depending on um, the value. 
So we send data to this in index and do some calculations and send it to there. Here's a, a, probably a, a better example, too. This is a servlet that's used to pull data from the query string. So there's an HTML page that sends the first name, last name, and other information to this page. And the second page will actually process it. So let's, oh, we have to have Tomcat running for this to work. But again, notice what it does. It grabs a value from the query string, and it actually outputs HTML with values from the form. The details of this really don't matter that much. What I want to emphasize is, number one, any kind of server-side scripting is going to typically use form data to do its job in many cases. If nothing else, just to log on. But if you do searches, uh, anything like that, that will also use form data. And we have a function whose job is, is to take that form data, do something with it, and then output some HTML, which is exactly what we're doing here. We're outputting some HTML to the client so it displays in their browser. So HTML outputted by Java code is a servlet. A web page that contains Java code amongst the HTML is a JSP page. So let's do a JSP example. Here's a nice one that helps you predict what kind of day you're going to have. All right? This is a pessimistic because it gives you a 95% of chance of not having a good day or not having a lucky day. Notice what we have. We have standard HTML and we have stuff in this kind of code. That is actually Java code, all right, that can run. And the Java code will run, and in this case, for example, it's going to randomly generate a number between 0 and 1. If that number is greater than 0.95, then this HTML gets displayed. Otherwise, this HTML gets displayed. And then it creates a link back to itself to run again, if you want to. Let's actually create this. I'm going to use uh, an application called NetBeans, which is an IDE. You could probably do this with Eclipse, too, but I'm a little more familiar with NetBeans. So I decided to use the, this as the example. So I'm going to go in. And I'm going to create a new project. No. Cool. Um, The interesting thing is, is that there, there's, all, there's a lot of different things that can let you do some different things, some non-standard things, all right? 
generally speaking, the world is sort of divided into the Microsoft world and the everyone else world as far as development platforms and so on. And if I was doing something on the Java side of things, I probably wouldn't be using a Microsoft web server, although I could. That would be a less standard way of doing it. And I probably wouldn't use Microsoft's development tools, but you can. All right? So generally speaking, people on the Java side of things would probably use an Apache web server, would probably use NetBeans or Eclipse to do their work, and might even be on a Unix machine, all right, or a Linux machine. It doesn't mean they have to be, but it's like they sort of go together, all right? Now, what something like that is good for is if you had someone that was really a sharp on the, on the Microsoft uh, development platform and you want them to do a JSP project, at least give them a tool they're familiar with. That would be, I would, I would say, the argument. But if I was doing something from scratch, I would want to probably would want to use the tools that are like part of Java. NetBeans is a product made by the Apache Foundation that also manages the Apache web server. So uh, I would probably take that approach. So I'm going to create a web project. Uh, it takes a while to activate it because you have all kinds of possibilities in NetBeans, but they're not all enabled right off the bat. project name, we'll just stick with web application one. It's going to put it in this location. I'm going to use the Glassfish server, which is a um, development web server, uh, sure based on Apache, has Tomcat enabled, so I can test things without having a full-blown web server running on my machine. All right. I'll go here and finish. It's going to create my project. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to create a new gives you a blank index.html. I'm going to go and I'm going to create a new JSP page. I'll just call it new JSP. Finish. So I'm going to paste the example in. Not that. I'll paste the example in from here. Now, when the web server runs this, anything that's plain old HTML gets sent to the server as it, or gets sent to the client as is. So no processing is needed. So the stuff that's plain old HTML, the web server doesn't do any processing for it. The stuff in these markup, anything from here and here, is Java land. So this represents Java code. So when this page loads, the server is going to send that to the client, that to the client, that to the client. It will come in and evaluate the statement. If this statement is true, it will send this part of the if statement out, and it will output the number. If it's not true, it will send that to the client, and it will output the number again. 
Either way, it's going to send a link back to the page that declared that. So I can right mouse on it, and I can run this. And it will do its thing. And it will output an HTML page. What we're seeing here is that's the code that exists on the server side. That's the code that is running on the server. What we'll see when we view it through the browser is the code that the browser sees. Maybe. This is taking a long, okay, here we go. And what this is going to tell me is I'm not going to have a lucky day. The number is 37, point 37. But I can try again. Notice what this delivers. This is a code that runs on the server, but browsers don't understand Java, right? Browsers understand HTML. So this code has to be processed and create HTML. So there's Java code inside my HTML page that is used to write and craft a uh, HTML document. If I look at this and view source, if I view source, I'll see that I, the client just gets plain old HTML. All right, the client doesn't get um, the Java code at all. Because browsers don't understand Java. All right? Therefore, that Java, gets pro or that Java code that exists on the server side gets processed and turned into the output of HTML. Now, this obviously is a very, very, very simple case. All right? I'm going to sit here until I have a good day, and then I'm going to quit. So close. I could cheat and change. There we go. I was just about thinking of doing that, of changing the percentage. All right, so I'm going to have a good day, so I'll quit there. Now, this obviously is just a start, all right, because we could include classes in here. We don't have any classes in here. We just have some hard-coded Java, but we could include classes and objects and do everything that we've done throughout our Java code throughout the semester. I do want to leave with one point, though. Remember I said how there's Java servlets and JSP pages. Here's the interesting thing. Both of them get compiled, and... JSP pages actually get compiled to Java servlets. So if I look at this and right mouse on this, I can say view servlet, and it will show me the Java servlet that this got compiled to. It's really just a matter of what you're, it's partly just a matter of what you're used to writing. Because uh, you could kind of go either way with this. Yes? Yeah. It, it, yeah, actually the server would create that for you. Yeah, the, the web server would create that to you. It, it creates and it compiles the... JSP page into a Java servlet. So um, it's just a way of writing it. Um, we, you know, we could talk about history of how these things evolved and all that. Uh, if you took someone that knew their HTML code and taught them a little bit of Java, boom, you could have make JSP pages. They don't have to worry about all this complicated Java servlets and creating classes and all that. They can just use essentially what they already know with this HTML and just, oh, a few extra things. One thing I want to touch on next time is uh, the notion of Java beans. 
all right, because those are pretty cool too, and those facilitate writing uh, web pages as well. So we'll we'll talk about that next time as well. The plan is is next time to spend more time on deployment, um, and after that. Uh, next Wednesday probably will be a work day for you just to work on assignments and, and get caught up. All right, have a great Thanksgiving. Those of you that aren't coming to lab, in fact, those of you who are coming to lab, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. But we'll see you upstairs or next week, one of the two.